Hey everyone, I'm Jordan Bodley and I'm a certified ethical hacker. You've probably heard the word DDoS or DOS, so let's discuss what this means. So let's start with the DOS attack first. A DOS attack is when you have a system that you own, uh, typically a laptop or an IoT device, that you then use to flood a web server or a website in hopes of taking it down to cause an outage. Um, this differs between a DDoS attack, where a DDoS attack you have an army of devices that are under your control um, with the same idea. You then take that army of devices to send traffic to a specified target in hopes of causing an outage. Uh, as mentioned, a DDoS attack is an army of bots to create what's called a botnet uh, to flood a target system in hopes of causing an outage. Uh, there are several, several types of DDoS attacks and they can occur on multiple layers of the OSI model. I'm not going to go over every type of DDoS attack by OSI model, but I'll go over a few. Uh, starting with layer 7, often what's called the application layer. Um, this is typically where you'll see what's called HTTP flood. Uh, or DNS query flood attacks. So an HTTP flood um, is often what's considered a volumetric attack. Um, the idea of this is you overwhelm the server with HTTP requests. Um, this can be browser-based or it can also impact an API as well. Uh, the idea here is actually kind of simple. Um, you may go to, let's say, a blog website that's loading multiple assets, whether it's images, HTML, CSS, you know, maybe even videos. Um, too. So you take those requests and you play them thousands of times in hopes of taking down that system. Um, you can also do this with post requests such as filling out a form, maybe you're trying to contact support or you're you know, creating, a, creating an account on a website. Um, again, you can replay this over thousands of times with the intent of causing an outage uh, on their end. So the other attack that I mentioned was a, a DNS flood attack. Uh, the idea of this is you overwhelm uh, the domain name system server or DNS server to disrupt DNS resolution. Uh, so a DNS server, think of it as kind of like the phone book of the internet. This associates an IP to a domain. Um, so if you want to go, if you, if you want to, go to Google, um, you're not having to type the IP address in. Instead, you just type in google.com or you know whatever region you're from. Um, and so the way that this attack works is you can actually Actually send invalid request uh, to the DNS server and still cause it to expend resources. Um, great example of this is maybe you send 100 requests, only one of them is actually valid. Uh, the other 99 that you're sending to the DNS server is still expending resources just to try to look up that content, even if it doesn't exist at all and give you some type of HTTP code uh, and response. Uh, so again, you know, if you send thousands of these, uh, you may be able to take a DNS server down. Uh, so looking at like layer six, this is where you'll see what's called uh, SSL abuse or exhaustion. Um, SSL abuse is kind of a simple concept um, or what's called SSL exhaustion. Uh, the SSL handshake um, is very um, resource extensive for the server having to initiate the request um, or rather receiving the initial request from the client. So in most cases, the server itself is going to be doing about 15x or 15 times the amount of legwork that the client is uh, whenever a request is or whenever a connection is being initiated for SSL. Uh, the way that this works is you target an SSL server, you immediately request renegotiation after completing the SSL handshake. Um, and again, if you have an army of bots to do this for you, you can send thousands of requests, constantly renegotiate uh, the SSL handshake, um, which causes a lot of stress on the server having to deal with this. Uh, looking at layer four, this is typically where you'll see like send floods or TCP reset floods. Uh, a send flood attack or what's also called a half open attack um, abuses what's called the TCP handshake. Uh, the TCP handshake is a three way handshake. So this starts off as potentially me. Um, I'm on my laptop here. I go to google.com. Well, when I go to google.com, the first thing that I like my computer does is it sends what's called a send packet, uh, which stands for synchronize. Once I send that packet, the Google server receives it and it then sends a response back, uh, what's called a send or an ACK uh, packet, uh, ACK meaning acknowledgement. Uh, so it sends those two back and then once I get it, I send back a ACK or an acknowledgement um, back to the Google server and now a connection has uh, been created. Well, the idea of this is you actually remove the third step of this. So I'm never sending the acknowledgement back uh, to the server. So what this does is when I'm sending the uh, original synchronized packet to them, this is using up memory um, on that server. And if I keep sending these and I never acknowledge that the connection has been established, this memory just keeps building and building and building until eventually it's, it's gonna burst and it may cause an outage. 
Um, so the other type of attack I mentioned was TCP reset. Um, so the idea of a TCP reset, um, if you're familiar with TCP versus UDP, TCP, typically both connections, they want to make sure that the information sent that the other party received and vice versa, uh, that there's no discrepancy in the data. So with this, typically, maybe you're downloading something and either your computer dies or your laptop dies or whatever the case is, you turn it back on and you go back to the site that you were downloading something from. Typically, a reset packet is sent to reestablish that connection, which is oftentimes why whenever you're downloading something, say it's, I don't know, a gig, um, a gigabyte of data, uh, maybe it dies 500 megs in, uh, and then when you come back, it starts off at 500 megs and it doesn't completely kill everything. Um, so the way that you do this is you can cause the server to look up invalid sessions, um, which causes an exhaustion um, of resources. Um, so now let's take, uh, take a step into layer three. Um, this is where you'll see what's called ICMP flood, um, also the ping of death, uh, and a smurf attack. So the internet control message protocol flood or ICMP flood, um, this is designed to target um, network devices to send ICMP echo requests uh, to ping every computer on that network. So whenever a echo request um, is sent uh, to those systems, it's also expecting an echo response back. Um, so as you can imagine, taking this and flooding every single system uh, for these responses, um, you can cause an outage uh, on the network. Uh, so something else uh, that I mentioned was the ping of death. Uh, this is actually simple. This isn't so much a thing or s too popular nowadays. I think the last instance, or at least the last one that I remember was from like 2013. Uh, but this is effectively using a ping command to crash the system. Um, so with this, whenever you're sending an IP, IPv4 packet, um, including the IP header, the max amount of bytes you can have is uh, 65,535 bytes. And this also includes a payload of uh, 84 bytes um, with this. So the idea of this is you can actually send malformed packets um, to your target system uh, in fragments. And then once that system has to reassemble everything, if you go beyond what you know the 65,535 bytes uh, a lot of systems don't know how to like what to do with it um, thus causing an outage also yeah so this is called the ping of death <laughs> um, so another one is also what's called a smurf attack uh, this can also this is a this can often be correlated to like an IC, I, ICMP flood um, you may see the two in one but they are very different uh, so a smurf attack is you also take advantage of ICMP um, you effectively send a packet out uh, and you say, hey, this is my IP, spoofing it. Uh, the IP is often the target system that, that you want to take down. And so you send this across the network and you say, all right, every, every asset uh, or every host in this network, I want you to respond to this IP address. Um, again, if, you know, if there's a thousand hosts listening on that network that then send a response back to the single system and may overload the system causing an outage. Um, one of the greatest analogies I've actually heard for a Smurf attack is someone pretending to be a CEO of a company Say you call an office manager, for example, and you say, hey, there's something urgent. Uh, I need you to call every employee at our company. I need you to call me call me back on a private number. Well, that private number is effectively the spoofed IP. Um, so, you know, maybe an email goes out or announcement goes out and this one target or one person is now the victim um, and they are getting potentially thousands, <laughs> thousands of phone calls, which obviously you can only answer so many at a time. Um, so this list is again, by no means complete. Um, uh, actually recently there was a really good uh, Akamai article that came out. They stopped a massive DDoS attack um, in Europe recently. Um, I would highly recommend looking up uh, Akamai DDoS uh, mitigation from July and this is uh, 2022. So uh, definitely look that up. This is typically because they've simply become a part of life. Um, typically when you buy an IoT or an Internet of Things device, the first thing you do is you unpack it, you plug it in, you connect it to your Wi-Fi network, and then everything just magically works. Uh, have you ever wondered why that is? <laughs> um, with that, typically in order, in order for your device to talk to other devices, there's some type of communication happening between those. You think it's maybe magic. Well, it's not. Um, and honestly, a lot of people don't understand like what that communication looks like. Um, again, they buy it, plug it in, and everything works, and no questions are asked about it. Um, if you dive into this a little bit further, IoT devices are typically often outdated. So you may you may buy a device, plug it in. Again, everything works great and as expected. 
but you may not actually get like a software update or a security update or a patch on that system for potentially a year, if at all, um, with that. So if a vulnerability comes out for that system, one, now you're exposed. Two, typically uh, the manufacturer that has created that IoT device may not have the amount of support for that specific device that they have for other devices, um, such as you know a laptop or a computer um, or even like a cell phone. Um, so with that, they're often more insecure. Um, if security patches do come out, they tend to be um, a lot slower than most security patches for, again, laptops, phones, etc. Um, so with that, they often become an easy target. Um, and once, once they have been compromised, they can, at least one IoT device, if you have one IoT device that's compromised in a network, it's very easy to compromise um, the others, especially if that IoT device you communicate, like that you compromise is also communication with other IoT devices. Uh, so all that being said, it's simply because they're insecure, they become a part of life, um, and people often don't think twice about it. Um, and if one of those is compromised, how do you know? You, re you simply don't. Um, and that is why they are a great target for DDoS attacks. Uh, well, I've, I've already mentioned this a little bit. Um, so the first thing is obviously an outage. Um, if you are under a DDoS attack and, a, and you have an outage of a system, this can lead to multiple repercussions in the long run, um, such as a damage to your brand. Uh, do you want to be that company that's always having to deal with DDoS attacks and your website is never up or the service that you're offering is always taken down because you're fighting off DDoS, DDoS attacks and you're not properly mitigating them. Uh, I know I wouldn't. Um, so then a byproduct of that then becomes customer loyalty. Um, if I'm a customer of you know a service that you're selling and I constantly have problems not being able to access the service that I am paying for, I have started to begin to lose my faith uh, in you. And then lastly, this can also impact financials. Um, if I end up leaving the service that you are offering, if you're a public company especially, this can lower your stocks um, and cause other repercussions. Maybe you have layoffs um, as a result of it. Uh, number one, I would say, is to keep devices up to date. Um, I know this may be a little bit harder for IoT devices that maybe don't have as many updates coming out for them, but ultimately keeping your devices up to date would greatly reduce um, your threat for a DDoS. I would also consider things like rate limiting, whether it's like how many send packets you're receiving from an IP or even like how many send packets you're sending out to a destination IP, um, incorporating things like send cookies so you're not starving yourself of resources, um, and maybe even applying like session limits, um, you know, across your network stack as well. Um, maybe you have a, maybe you have like a host that normally gets a thousand requests a day, all of a sudden it's getting a hundred thousand. And then taking that even a step further, being able to um, uh, monitor for something like that or create an alert that your security team or your engineers IT team will be able to see uh, will be able to see and use while you're under attack um, so another thing would be building out like a robust architecture so when I say architecture I don't only mean infrastructure I mean infrastructure and also like organizational policies and procedures um, and part of that you will probably have a response plan um, or like a business continuity plan and probably the first thing of your response plan that I would I would recommend is don't panic. Um, if you if you panic, you're going to quickly lose sight of the goal, and that's one mitigating the DDoS attack, but two also bringing your services or restoring your services back. And so part of these plans, you may have like a failover um, plan, or you may have like you know maybe you already built like high availability in place. Um, especially if you're in the cloud, they give you you know they give you the luxury of choosing different regions that you want to build your infrastructure out into. And if one region goes down, how quickly can you fail over to the second region? And if you need to, can you scale that second region up even further? And I mentioned that uh, because you want to test it. What happens if your region one? receives you know 70 percent of your traffic but there's a thousand hosts in there to deal with it well maybe your second region only has 200 hosts so a fifth the amount of traffic if something happens with region one and you're having to fail over to region two that has the fifth a fifth of the amount of resources i would bet that your region two is going to fall over as well so being able to test that uh, will greatly increase your security posture um, but also it will greatly reduce your threat for a ddos attack 
Um, and this may, this isn't what I would consider like quote mitigating a DDoS attack, but it often complements a DDoS attack is building out a network diagram and keeping it up to date. Um, so whenever, whenever you're building out your infrastructure, whether it's on-prem or whether it's, you know, in the cloud, having an idea of like where the DDoS got, like in the OSI model, you'll be able to see the services in front of that or even behind that, uh, that, that potentially failed. Um, so having a network diagram that's always up to date will also greatly reduce your threat here. Um, and then lastly, but certainly not least, um, you may simply <laughs> want to rely on like a third party, um, such as like Akamai or Cloudflare, for example, who are two companies that, you know, they specialize in this. Uh, maybe, you know, simply, you know, pay them and be like, hey, this is what we're seeing. Um, they'll probably give you some advice on, you know, where to put them in your uh, tech stack, typically somewhere on the edge. Uh, so that way they can absorb um, the DDoS attack and you're not, you know, you're not sweating it yourself um, to then absorb it yourself. So I know I said a lot about DDoS attacks. So I hope you're able to take this information that I presented and either apply it at your existing organization um, or I, ho I simply hope that you learned something. Again, I'm Jordan Bodley. I'm a certified ethical hacker. Remember, do your part, be cyber smart.